Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is January the 11th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we're coming to the end of the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, we know from our last time together that Jacob was told by God to return back to his homeland which would mean that he is going to face Esau again. And obviously there is much apprehension in doing so because he knows the last time he saw Esau, which was some 21 years ago, that Esau wanted to kill him because he had stolen his blessing. And chapter 32, verse 1 says, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He wants to spy things out. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant. Notice, Jacob calls himself servant. Now, Jacob is a deceiver, and so he's using deception here. He's manipulating Esau into forgiving him by trying to butter him up. But he says, Speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob saith, I have sojourned with Laban. I've been with Laban for quite some time. And while I was with him, I acquired oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants. And I've sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Now, again, I find it very interesting here the way that Jacob is using this deception because he's calling Esau his Lord, his master, and he's placing himself in a position of servant. Now, the messengers came back to Jacob in verse 6 and said, We did go to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and he's bringing 400 men with him. Now, you can imagine in Jacob's mind, this strikes a great amount of fear because he thinks that they're coming to defeat him. He's told them that he has a great amount of people that now serve him, and so he thinks Esau's coming with 400 men and that this great battle is going to ensue between them. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, the flocks, the herds, the camels, into two bands. And his thinking was is that if Esau will defeat one, when he gets to the next one, he may have a change of heart. So I'm going to break my people up into these different bands, send each one one at a time, separating them by several hundred yards, and I'll place me and my immediate family at the very rear. And so Esau will have to smite one group after the next before he eventually comes to us. And hopefully if he has a taste for vengeance, it will be satisfied by the time he reaches us. And then Jacob prayed in verse 9, and he said, O God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all of thy mercies and of all of thy truth, which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Friends, that should be the position of our hearts as the people of God. It's no better said anywhere in scripture. I am not worthy of the least of all of thy mercies, of all of thy truth, which thou hast shown unto me. When we truly get a vision of who God is and who we are, those are the only words left. That is the only prayer that is to be prayed as we hang our heads before our Savior and we beat our chest and we say, Be merciful to me, O God, a sinner, for I am not worthy of the least of all of your mercies, of all of your goodness, of all of your compassion, of all of your promises, and all of the hope that you have offered unto me. 
Deliver me, I pray thee, says Jacob in verse 11, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And Jacob knows if he were to get what he deserved because of the way that he has used deception in his life throughout his life, mercy would be the last thing that God should favor him with. And so he reminds God in verse 12, you, O Lord, said unto me, I will do thee good. And so Jacob is basically saying, I do not deserve your mercies, but you have given your word. And I know that you are a God of your word. Yet even though he says this by his actions, he proves otherwise because he continues with the division of the people. He sends them forth in groups, placing himself at the very last, whereas if he truly trusted God, he would have gone to met Esau with his head held high, having confidence in God that God was going to keep him, that God was going to preserve him. Well, verse 22 tells us that Jacob did rise up that night. He took his two wives, his two women servants, his 11 sons, and he began his journey. Now, while Jacob was alone, he wrestled with a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the man said unto Jacob, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let thee go until you bless me. And he said unto Jacob, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob or deceiver, but now you will be called Israel, which simply means he who strives with God. And this is why the people of Jacob from the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob will become known as Israel. And this is a turning point in Jacob's life because Jacob is no longer a deceiver. He has had an interaction with the living God and will never be the same because of it. Well, Jacob in verse 29 says, I've told you my name. Now you tell me what is your name? And the man said, why do you ask my name? And he blessed Jacob. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, which means face of God, because he said to himself, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And so as we were told in verse 24 that Jacob wrestled with a man, we now see that Jacob didn't wrestle with a man, but he wrestled with God who had appeared in the form of a man. Well, in chapter 33, we're going to see a twist in the plot because up until this point, if reading the story for the first time, we may think that Jacob is the one who is in the right and Esau plays the villain. But chapter 33 begins by saying, Jacob lift up his eyes and he looked and he saw Esau coming and with Esau, 400 men. So he divided the children unto Leah, unto Rachel and unto Bilhah and Zippah, his two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph in the very back. And so by dividing the family in this way, Jacob is showing who is most precious to him. And obviously it is Rachel and Joseph, because if Esau is going to work his way to the very back, killing everyone in between, Rachel and Joseph will be the last to be attacked. Now, as Esau approached Jacob, Jacob fell to the ground and bowed before him seven times. And Esau seeing this, seeing all the different groups of people with all their herds and flocks, seeing how his younger brother Jacob is trying to butter him up, yet Esau ran to meet Jacob. He embraced Jacob. He fell on his neck and he kissed his younger brother and they wept there together. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw the women and the children. And he said, who are these with thee? And Jacob said, these are the children which God has graciously given thy servant. Notice he calls himself his servant again, because he not only realizes Esau being a man's man could overtake him, could kill him and all that he has, but he also knows in his heart of hearts that he mistreated his older brother Esau by deceiving him and tricking him. 
But both of them have grown much wiser in their years apart. And naturally, just simply by growing up, by becoming aged men. And so Esau is brokenhearted by this and says in verse 8, What do you mean by all the different groups that I met along the way? And Jacob said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, brother, I have enough. Keep what you have unto yourself. But Jacob, feeling the guilt in his heart, says, no, I beg of thee. If I have found grace in your sight, I cannot give you back your blessing, but I can impart something to you. Please take what I'm offering as an act of forgiveness. For I have now seen your face. And in seeing you, it is as if I have seen the face of God because you were pleased with me. You're not holding a grudge against me. So take what I offer unto you because God has dealt graciously with me and I have enough. And so Esau, as an act of mercy, in realizing that this is the only way that Jacob can gain penance for what he has done, he took it. And he said unto his brother, let us take our journey. Let us go. Let us return home. But Jacob says, you know, my Lord, that the children are tender. They're young. The flocks and herds that are with me are young. And if I drive them too hard, they will all die. So you go ahead of me and I will come behind you and I will meet you in Seir. And so in verse 16, Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and in Succoth he built him a house, he made stalls for his cattle, he bought a parcel of field near Shechem, and he erected there an altar and praised God. Now this is an interesting story, and what we can learn from it is this, that as the people of God, when we wrong others, the torment of that indiscretion haunts us. And even after we make all efforts to make things right, we still feel the guilt and shame because of the trespass that we've committed against another. Yet on the flip side of that, we also see from the other's perspective, the one who has the forgiving heart that's not willing to hold the grudge. And depending on what event of our lives we're thinking about, we stand on either side of the issue. We are the one that needs forgiveness or we are the one that is offering forgiveness. And we are to be open to both. We are to realize that we are going to make mistakes along the way. But God knows our hearts. And if we're truly sincere in sorrow and repentance, he will forgive us. On the other side, the longer that we live, the more opportunity we have for others to offend us for others to wrong us, for others to trespass against us. Yet, as we see from the life of Esau, we are to be willing to forgive, knowing most of all that when we do not forgive, it affects us most. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that bitterness brings rottenness to the bones. It eats away at us from the inside out and eventually it will destroy us. So it's healthy both physically and spiritually to always be willing to forgive others. And if we were to be honest at looking at this story, judging these two men, recognizing what we know about their lives, it would seem that the more honorable of the two would be Esau. Yet it is Jacob that finds favor in God's eyes. It is Jacob upon which the nation of Israel will be built, the nation that belongs to God. Yet it is Esau who has shown more character, who has shown more honor. And it's not for us to question God because we know the Bible tells us that God chooses the unlikely things of the world to make the biggest impact on the world. And so where you and I may choose Esau as being the more honorable, God for his divine purposes has chosen Jacob because he sees something in Jacob that at this point you and I don't see in the story. And I want to end simply by reminding us that there may be others that we would pick 
that we would think would be more worthy, that would be found more faithful, that could be used for the greater purposes of God than ourselves. But for some divine, mysterious reason, God has chosen you and I, friends, to reach the world around us. And so don't spend a lot of time on trying to understand why, because most likely you never will. Just simply recognize that God has chosen you and do something with the gift for his glory that he has bestowed upon you. I realize that that's much easier said than done. But what makes no sense before men makes perfect sense with God. What is absolutely useless to men is valuable to God. And friend, you are valuable. He has selected you and chosen you. And there are people that you know, there are people that you encounter on an everyday basis that no one in this world can reach except you and you alone. So be faithful with what God has given you. Do all to his glory and then rest in the fact of even though you don't see the complete puzzle, even though you don't know the total outcome, you know that everything you do in his name will not return void. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're going to close there today. And I'm so grateful and honored to again, to be able to sit before the word of God, learn the word of God with you together. And I pray that as you are challenged in this story, that it will motivate you to be a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus in doing all he's commanded you to do each and every day. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.